Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're going to open with a call to worship from Psalm 98. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? Uh, the scripture will be on the screen behind me here, and there will be some bolded sections that we can read out loud together. Psalm 98, uh, verses 1 through 6, says, Sing to the Lord, uh, sing a new song to the Lord, who has worked wonders, whose right hand and holy arm have brought salvation. The Lord has made known salvation and has shown justice to the nations. He has remembered truth and love for the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Sing out your joy. Sing psalms to the Lord with the harp, with the sound of music, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Acclaim the King, the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. On this terrestrial ball, to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. To him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord. stars of light who fixed this earthly ball. Now hail the strength of Israel's might and crown him Lord of all. Now hail the strength of Israel's might and crown him Lord of all. seated. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, the Cottiers are on a well-deserved vacation, and so, uh, but that doesn't keep us from worshiping as we normally do. This is a time of the service where we, that we call prayers of the people, and since this is the first Sunday of the month, as part of that, we, we collect our uh, monthly tithes and offerings, and, and this is a privilege for us. I know many of us give in this digital age. We give online. Uh, but this is an opportunity for us to express our trust, our dependence, our faith, and our worship to the Lord for the way he has blessed us. He is, he is the owner of all. We are his. And so when we give, we give with thanksgiving, acknowledging that he is the one who, who has provided it all anyway. And so we give to his church and his mission and the things that, that, he, is, uh, collect, or that, that he desires to do through us because he has blessed us to be a blessing. So before I ask the usher, uh, ushers uh, to come, and collect your uh, gifts. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for the, this gift of life that you have given us through Christ. And, and God, thank you that we have a chance 
to, to, sh to express our faith in, in the way we give. Lord, we acknowledge that everything is from you, that all good things are from you. And uh, you, have, you by, by giving, Lord, it's a chance to, to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. And so, Lord, I pray that as we give, we would give with great uh, joy and thanksgiving and faith and worship. Uh, receive these. And God, I pray that you would, as you have blessed us, that you would, you would use these gifts to bless others through it. And so we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Praise God for all that He has done. And praise Him for He has overcome. The grave is beaten, love has won. Praise God, our Savior, Christ the Son. Amen. 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 God, we praise you. God, we praise you. Because you are holy, great and mighty. The moon and the stars declare who you are. I'm so unworthy, but still you love me forever, my heart. We'll sing of how great you are. Would you stand as we continue worshiping in song? It's falling from the clouds, a strange and lovely sound. I hear it in the thunder and the rain. It's ringing in the skies like cannons in the night. The music of the universe plays. The singing, you are holy, the great and mighty. The moon and the stars declare who you are. I'm so unworthy, but still you. galaxies and reaching far beyond the Milky Way and let's join in with the sound come on let's sing it out as the music of the universe plays singing you are holy great and mighty the moon and the stars So unworthy, but still you love me forever. My heart will sing of how great, oh glory, honor, power is yours. Amen. Oh glory, honor, power is yours. Amen. Oh glory, honor, power is yours. Forever, amen. You are holy, great and mighty, the moon and the stars. 
stars declare who you are and i'm so unworthy but still you love me forever my heart will sing of you Matthew 22, the scripture says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So church, as God has instructed us in these great commandments, because we have not always lived in full obedience, let us now confess our sins to God, trusting Christ as our Savior and Lord. Take a moment in prayer. Are you hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Mm. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ.
As you wait for the crown, tell the world of the treasure you found. Church, through Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Read this section out loud with me. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. This is from Acts 13 and Ephesians 1. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, good morning again and welcome. Um, glad that you're here. Thank you for uh, coming to worship with us at Fountain City. Uh, for those who may be new, uh, uh, we are glad that you're here. So for those who may be joining us online, we are certainly glad to worship with you this morning. Fountain City, we're approaching our five-year-old, our five-year anniversary or birthday uh, since we were launched. Uh, we are a church that bel firmly believes that that God has created us and designed us to 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 be to find life in a relationship with Him, and it's through Jesus, His Son and faith in him and what he has done on the cross for us that we can experience that life. And so we gather on Sunday mornings to, to encourage one another, to spur one another on to love and good deeds, to teach and worship and, and hear the word of God preached. And then we scatter from here to, to, to live the life as sent ones uh, in, our, in our world uh, with our neighbors and our, and our colleagues. So if that sounds like you, the place that you want to be, you're in the right place. Um, so anyway, we... If, if, you are, if you are new or want to get connected, we, uh, there's a couple ways to do that. On the back of your bulletin or your uh, bulletin sheet here, there are two QR, QR codes. One is just to get more information. One, you can scan, fill out the short form that might get you, get you connected with uh, somebody on our staff. Uh, the other is if you have a prayer request, you can scan that and let us know about how we can be praying for you. So those are two ways to get, to get connected. Um, there are a few announcements that I wanted to let you know. So normally, uh, obviously, this is a Sunday in uh, holiday weekend in July in the summer when a lot of people are scattered. And so we would normally have a kids class that comes right after this. Today, there is no kids worship. And so we we'll just all stay together. Uh, but the, the, the room behind us, if there's any wiggly kids or kids that need a break, the Rosewood Beach, just right behind us, is open, and there will be live stream there. So you can take your kids in there if, if, uh, if they need um, a break. Um, another announcement is on, when, on throughout the week, every other week, we, we meet for what we call uh, our 1025 nights. 1025 is taken from he Hebrews 1025, uh, which it, it encourages us to gather and meet together and to encourage one another. And so we, we uh, gather every other week. Here at Meadowbrook in this room, we have supper together from 6 to 8 p.m. We have a, then we, we have a guided teaching and discussion time. So it's really interactive and, and, and uh, a lot of fun. And so the next one is this coming Thursday, uh, July 11th. It's hard, to we it's hard to believe it's already July. That's weird even to say. But it is the reality. So this, this Thursday, July 11th, uh, we're going to be gathering again. Uh, if, you would, if you wouldn't mind going to the website and registering just so that we know how much food we can get, that would be a, 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 a super helpful way to do that. And then finally, uh, I know a lot of us have kids and want to get together throughout the week. Um, and so there's, we have park play dates 
uh, kind of throughout the summer. And the next one is this, also this Thursday, July 11th. And they're going to be meeting at Olathe Spray Pad, which I have no idea where that's at. So good luck with that. Uh, but it's going to be at 930 in the morning before it gets too late or it gets too hot. And so, and feel free to bring others and bring friends with that. Okay, um, with James gone this, this week, we, are, we have the privilege of hearing from uh, Pastor Dave Robinson. Dave is, a, is ordained in the e- teaching elder in the EPC in our denomination. Um, I served with him at, a, at another church. He is a friend to all, and he's a father to some and grandfather to some in our congregation. And so uh, we are excited to have him uh, preaching the word this morning. Um, but before I do that, and before I bring him up, I'm going to read our passage. And after I do that, I'm going to give you like two, you know, 30 seconds or so to greet one another. Um, and then Dave will come up and try to quiet you down. So uh, let me read the passage. Uh, the passage this morning is from Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. It'll be on the screen, I believe, as I, as I read it. And Luke writes this, one of the Pharisees was requesting, him, was requesting to eat with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner, and when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at, at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and she wiped them with the hair of her head and began kissing his feet. And anointing them with the perfume. Now, when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to him, "They said to them, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who, what, who, and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, and that she is a sinner." And Jesus responded, "Simon, I have something to say to you." And and he replied, "Say it, teacher." A moneylender had two debtors. The one who owed him five, one the one owed five hundred denarii. And the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he canceled the debts of both. So which of them will which of them will love him more? And Simon answered and said, I assume the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And he said to him, You have judged correctly. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she has not stopped kissing my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. And for this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And those who were reclining at the table with him began saying to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so as Dave comes up, take a, take a moment, stand up and greet somebody around you. Good morning, everybody. I know that was a short greeting, but I want to greet you too. I hope you're doing well. I hope you had a great 4th of July weekend. We sure did. Uh, The weather has been cooperative, hasn't it? Hope hope you've had a good one. Well, today uh, we're going to get into the Word of God. We just read the passage. It's It's an incredible passage. It's very deeply meaningful to me. I'll tell you why in a second. I want to begin with this kind of uh, question here. Throughout my walking with Christ's journey, I've often wondered why so few 
are following him. Now, I know some would be sure to ask, you know, why is it important to follow him? What's so great about it? What's so good about knowing Jesus? Or they might ask, why would really anybody do that? Why would anybody bow to Jesus? Why would anybody listen to him? Why would anybody obey or follow him? Well, my, my journey um, has been full of adventure. I could say that. It's been full of surprises. It's also had a few trials, just like your journey has. But wow, has it ever been worth it for me. My journey took uh, a special anniversary uh, back in January, uh, or excuse me, February 22nd. I, I've known Christ um, for 50 years, and I've never stopped following him. When I came to know Christ in my senior year in high school, everybody said to me, Dave, you're so sanguine and spontaneous and blah, 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 this won't last. And um, every time I go back to a high school reunion, which I'm going to my 50th next week, um, they're always surprised that I'm still following him. So today we're going to go right to the heart of why people do follow him, why people trust him. I'll tell you, in a nutshell for me, I was tired of postponing my emptiness. Every choice I ever made uh, always led to more emptiness, and I thought it would fill the void, and it never did. Another reason I follow him is because I've been surprised by the certainty of truth. That when I read the word of God and it becomes alive in my soul and it's like it's a living word, it has provided assurance and certainty and hope and a foundation for decision making. And I've been so surprised by it, I would never not follow him. Another reason is I've experienced freedom that comes through the peace of forgiveness. Now, forgiveness is really important. We just sang about it. But let me tell you a quick story about me. There was a time in my life when I te tested the depths of love. I tested the depth uh, and commitment of my parents' love for me and also God's love for me. You may not see it in me right now, but I was a liar. I lied all the time. I disobeyed the law. I was arrested at a young age. I did a lot of stupid things. I mocked other people pretty much with regularity. I fought. I mean, I fought. And then I made vows uh, that I couldn't keep. Now, at the same time, while I'm this troubled individual, I had a profound sense of right and wrong. I really did. I felt guilty all the time. I just couldn't control myself. Um, I felt trapped by my own fun-loving, free-spirited lack of self-control. Love showed up where I least expected it, uh, in two places, when a policeman arrested me and said I was under arrest for possession of marijuana. I mean, right when he said it, the Lord, I, a thought came into my head. It's like, I'm answering your prayer, follow me. I'm like, where did that come from? That did not come from me. And then in the, the, the drive home with my dad, and as we parked in our home driveway, Love showed up when I was at my worst and I was led to Christ. Since coming to Christ, God's love has shown me that he cares for me deeply, that he wants the very best for me. And when I experienced it, finally experienced it, I didn't want to do anything more than develop my relationship with God and to surrender to him. Now, today's text, which we just read, I think it will knock you off your feet and make you smile. It has me. I have it etched in an important ring, not this one, Luke uh, 7, 47. It's really the first verse in Scripture that explained why I love Jesus. And I get to preach it to you today, and it's going to make you smile. But when I think about that, that text in this ring, I, I go, wow, what's the real essence of that text? We're going to unpack it. But Jesus rebukes a respected leader of the day. He goes against accepted religious and cultural values and religious thought, and he lifts up a despised woman. That verse is in my ring. 
It goes against all common thinking of the day. And the reason it's in my ring is because it shows the love of God and how important it is to develop a relationship with him. So we've already read the passage, but the big idea of it for me today is when a person experiences extravagant love, it leads to extravagant surrender. The context of what Doug just read takes place in Bethany. Jesus visited Bethany 11 times in his three and a half year ministry. It is where he got to know his good friends Lazarus and Mary and Martha, where Lazarus was raised from the dead weeks before the crucifixion of Christ. Bethany is also the place where Jesus gave the Great Commission, where he commissioned the church to go and make disciples and baptize and teach every nation. It is also the place where at the end of his 40 days on the planet after his resurrected body, in his resurrected body, it's where his ascension took place, right outside Bethany. It's an important city. It's so important that Zechariah prophesies that it is the very place where Jesus, when he comes again, he touches down, Bethany. It's a very important city. Um, so here's the context. Jesus is a year and a half into his ministry. It was, uh, he was invited into um, the Pharisee's home of Simon. And in that day, you should know that a meal often was not a private affair. It was common to permit people to come in, sit against the wall, stand against the wall, and listen, and also converse with the people at the table. That is why whenever you see Jesus in the house of Simon paintings like these two here, you see many are surrounding the table. The one on the left hangs in my living room because of this passage. It hangs, the real one hangs in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. At this time, Jesus is making life miserable for the Pharisees. He's telling them that you are misrepresenting the law, the Old Testament law. You're misrepresenting God in every way. So this was not likely a very friendly dinner. I think Simon was trying to find fault in Jesus to ruin his reputation. And their little meeting was interrupted by a woman. Verse 36, Jesus is reclining at the couch um, to eat at the table. His feet are hanging out. He's leaning on the table. It's very, very much like this painting here. His legs are outstretched. This woman came in. She had an alabaster jar filled with perfume. And the first thing that I notice in verses 36 through 38 is just from this little phrase, she stood. And what I get from this, and I'll tell you why, is that love, the love of God, invites a relationship with you. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping. Now, emotions are like messengers from the internal world to the external world. They communicate that something is felt profoundly. Her tears are coming from experiencing love. She's extremely grateful. So picture her, she's standing somewhere near the table, maybe inches even a little closer, wonder, wondering what she's going to do next. She's weeping, 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 and then she kneels. And the text says it in the durative imperfect tense in the Greek language, which means she kept on or she went on weeping, wiping, kissing, pouring, anointing. It was a very, very emotional few moments where she's like profusely doing all these verbs, weeping, kissing, pouring, wiping. It says in the Greek, this, this word for um, kissing is that she was covering his feet with kissing. 
Augustine said, instead of water for his feet, she gave him tears. And I love this, the blood of her heart. And what I, what I get from this is Jesus made absolutely no objection to this. He didn't do what the Pharisee was hoping he would do or would have done himself. He didn't, Jesus didn't give her the left foot of fellowship and kick her off the table. He didn't say, what are you doing? Get out of here, you despised. I mean, he, he, didn't, he didn't show any disdain. He just let her keep on, keep on, keep on. And it's a form of acceptance and loving her back. She stood, she stood closer, she wept, she fell, she kissed. And he had compassion for her. She's likely feeling, while this is going on, oh, at least this is what I'd be doing. I, I'm so sorry, Jesus, but I, I, I need mercy. I'm accepted. You're not pushing me away. Despite everything I've done, I'm, I'm loved. Now, my shame is trying to hang on to me, Jesus, but as you just let me do this, my shame is giving way. It's cowering before the love of God. And I am astounded. I'm sure this is what she's feeling. As others objected to her being there, Jesus showed love and acceptance. Now let's put you and me into this story. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me. And he invites us into a relationship. And that means we come to him. So let me ask you a question. Are you thirsty? Are you weighed down by anything? Are you tired? Jesus loves you. Even though you're weak and, and broken in sin, if we admit our sin and turn from it and trust him, he will not despise us at all. If he doesn't reject this gal he's not going to reject you he's going to comfort teach and lead you Matthew 28 excuse me 11 28 through 30 Jesus says come to me come to me all of you who are tired and carry heavy burdens I will give you rest let me teach you and in my teaching and leadership you will find rest for your souls Love is inviting a relationship. In John 7, he says again, something similar. If anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. In Psalm 51, 17, it says, A broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So are you turning to anything else for joy or purpose or meaning. Jesus is saying, if you're thirsty, pl please quit going that way to satisfy your thirst. If you're tired, quit, quit carrying it and moving away from me. Come to me. If you're thirsty, come to me and drink. Let me be the source of your whole life, the entirety of your whole life. So this is, there's, those are those verses. Forgot to click there, but... But you have to repent, though. We must repent. Turn to God. When we turn to God, we're saying that our lives are solely about Him, that our trust is in Him alone. It's all now about Him. We're going this way. We hear Him call, and we, we hear it again, and we keep going away from Him, and we get more and more tired and more and more thirsty, and then we decide, I'm not doing this anymore. When I was 17, I turned around and went, I'm done. I mean, forget that. And my life became entirely about him because I was convinced he was inviting me into a relationship that brought certainty and peace and love and forgiveness. And I've, I've never gotten over it. Second thing I see in this passage is that love invites or inspires worship. This woman shows that worship comes from a contrite heart that has experienced grace and mercy. Again, this woman stood 
before she kneeled. She likely hesitated to drop. She stood before she kneeled. She might have been thinking, am I going to do this? I know I'm going to interrupt them. It's going to be super strange. I know this, but I'm overwhelmed. I have to do this. Her reputation preceded her, and she knew it. She wasn't welcome in this company of people. So what she did took great courage. So let's talk about worship in this context for you and me. I think she shows that worship reflects a deep respect for the majesty and dignity of God. This woman shows that worship seeks to intentionally lift up his immense worth, his immense beauty. And let's not forget for you and me how important worship is. It's important because God deserves it. And not only for that reason, but we need it. We need to worship. Um, one thought about worship for me is that it reminds me of my place. When I humble myself before God, it's like, yeah, I'm not the most important person ever. It reminds me of my place that I'm not in control, that God will see me through difficulties. This one that I'm bowing before, I'm doing it for a reason. He speaks the truth. He's the good shepherd. He's the only wise God who can lead me. And it makes my joy complete. You're maybe familiar with the famous concept that C.S. Lewis once articulated, like why some people go, God's kind of cocky if he wants to be praised all the time. It's like, what's that about? Why does God want to be praised? Is he so insecure and narcissistic that he wants it? And, and C.S. Lewis goes, oh, no, 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 no. You've got this whole thing backwards. When you praise, it makes your joy complete. Think about when the Chiefs turn the game around in the, the Super Bowl or when the rules won in the bottom of the 10th or 11th, game seven, when Hosmer uh, came around and slid face first to the home. And we didn't just go, hey, that was awesome. No, we praised. We praised him. We threw our hands up and threw our voices out. Praise makes our joy complete. So worship's really important. Now, sometimes worship takes, takes a little work uh, for me at least, sometimes my heart, when I set aside my time to worship, maybe every Sunday for you, you're, you're setting aside time to worship, and, and sometimes your heart, like mine, is awake to the point of tears, and I, I yearn for God's presence, I yearn for His truth, His mercy, His Word, and my mind soaks up the Word of God like a sponge. There are other times when I my body is tired, my mind is scattered, my mind is dull, and my heart has no place in my worship at all. And I'm mindlessly praying there, mindlessly sitting there. Here's something practical for you. In order to focus for me, I have a prayer journal. I have, I have about maybe 15 or 16 of these over the years. I keep them usually all for about two or three years and I fill them up. This one's not full. You, well, it's partially full, but it, it'll get full. And what I did once was a study on prayer and there are four major aspects to prayer from the Lord's Prayer. And I'll just say what they are in my vernacular, worship or adoration, confession, intercession, or you know, praying for yourself or others, petitioning or intercession. And then the fourth is lead us not into temptation. So you pray to God with the devil in mind that there's an enemy that I have that I need to resist with the truth. And there, there are prayers offered to God from the word of God where you're resisting an area of temptation. So in my prayer journal, I, I section off those four parts. And, and, you know, like in my intercession, I have Doug and Amy's name in here. I have James and Lindsay's name right here. But in my worship section, 
I, I start off with what I call focus definitions. A focus definition is turned to every time I feel like, oh, Dave, uh, you've been looking at your phone, uh, you're 20 minutes into your quiet time, and you haven't even begun to worship right now. And so I go to my focus definitions, which are written with scripture in mind, and they're written my own definition of what worship is, and they're written emotionally, and it snaps me back into worship. These are uh, two of my, my definitions there. Worship is giving loving expressions to him for who he is and what he's done. When I read that, I wrote that. When I read that, I go, Dave, come on, get after it. Reflect loving expressions to him. Do it. And I wake up my soul. Bless the Lord on my soul. Soul, wake up. Worship. So the other one you can see there is longing for his fellowship and nearness. Now, the reason why I say this is because the woman is worshiping. And I don't know if you thought about this, but it took a little planning on her part. She had to buy or probably gather the perfume, put it in a jar, think, make a plan, find Jesus she had to do a little work, and sometimes we do too. The, uh, the best part of this passage is this short story that Jesus tells, and it shows the gospel's extravagant love, which is what the whole passage is about. Love inviting a relationship, inspiring worship, and following Jesus. This parable is told. In the parable, the creditor, the moneylender, is God. Who is God? He is holy. He is just, he is high, he is lifted up, he's glorious, he's pure, he's faultless. His uncommon holiness causes us to respond as Isaiah responds in Isaiah 6, 1 through 5. Woe is me, I am lost, I am unclean. He is highly exalted. So the moneylender in this short story, don't forget what he's like. He's absolutely pure, so pure that the angels in heaven that fly around his throne only have one thing to say forever, holy, holy, holy. Another word for holy is nothing common about him. God, the one that we follow, is uncommonly pure, uncommonly kind, uncommonly merciful. There's, he's strange. That's another word for holy strange, uncommon. But in the parable too, we see that the debtors are equally unjust. Now, the debtors in this story are, make no mistake about it, it's you and it's me. In our eyes, between you and me, one of us may be better than others. Let's say my debt is like 500 and yours is like 50. Good for you. Um, when the woman and Simon are, are compared, Simon's debt might be 50 and the woman's 500, but in God's eyes, they and we are equally bankrupt. Simon could not pay his 50, nor the woman her 500. If both were not forgiven of their debt, they would perish, and so would we. We're equally eternally separated from God now and eternally if something is not done with our debt. Now, one more thing about our debt. Our debt is infinite. It's not like this parable. That's not the meaning of the parable. Like, oh, there's a limit to your debt and you can pay it off. No. As debtors, we have no resources to offer to pay our debt. The sins that we commit are sins committed against an infinite being, not a common money lender. That makes our debt infinite, and it requires an infinite satisfaction on God's part, which as finite creatures, we cannot ever pay. She was known in the city to be a sinner, and you and I are known by God also to be sinners. Would you mind advancing that one? Look at uh, Hebrews 4.13. Nothing in all creation is hidden from this uncommonly holy and pure God, this infinite God that our debt is committed against. Nothing is hidden from Him. 
for his sight. Everything is uncovered and laid before, laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Romans 3.23 and 6.23, I know you've heard it a bazillion times, just don't forget it. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And the earnings or the wages of sin is death. That's not the end of the story here. We have a debt, and it's, whew, it's a big one. But it goes on and says, basically, that the debtor, the creditor, loves you. And the forgiveness that he offers is just, it's merciful, it's gracious. So this infinite one became flesh and blood and died for you and me, his law is satisfied justly because sin actually was paid for. He didn't go, okay, not that big a deal. Come on in. Or yeah, in a relation. No, it had to be paid for, and he paid for it. This infinite God became flesh and blood so he could bleed and die and remit our sins. It was expressed, this love was expressed by dying in our place. And he satisfied the debt that we owed at his own expense. You know these verses. But this woman had experienced the love that, Je that actually took Jesus to the cross. And from the cross, he cried out, Father, now just think about this. Father, please forgive them. He's, he's been tortured. He's been hassled and hammered by the devil in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's been nailed to the cross. He's suffering like crazy. His lungs are on fire. He's being mocked by everybody. They're camping out and having hot dogs while he suffers, and he goes, Father, forgive them, for they don't really know what they're doing. She experienced this love and is expressing her response. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we're yet sinners, ungodly, he died for us in our place. So that's the little story. But there's, the story kind of doesn't end there. It goes on and says that worship is the response. And worship is intimate. She's wiping away her tears from Jesus' feet with her hair. Just like profusely doing this for minutes. She stretched out with her face just above the ground resting on the feet of Jesus in adoration. Just picture this. And this says her worship is somewhat bold. Worship doesn't care what other people think. So when you worship, lock in. Don't care what other people think. Emote. Love Jesus back. Express it in your way. The Pharisee, on the other hand, he felt that his debt was in the 50 range, not the 500. And he treated his sins flippantly. His sin was not that big of a deal. So love for God and worship was blocked. Worship was blocked by this attitude, this self-love, this high self-appraisal. And even in his mistakes, self-love seems to have cried out to him or motivated him, I, I can do better than that, and I, and I will. I can do it, I, I will. I, I feel something. But God is not in the picture at all. And if you think your sins are lightweight, not that big a deal, you're not only wrong, but think of what you're doing here. You, you think that you have no need of what makes Jesus tick, what brings Jesus alive, and that is to give you peace. That is to forgive you, to show you mercy, to show you love in such profound ways. Yep, I don't need any of that. So let's don't treat our sin flippantly ever. Let's get real. It's forgiven, but let's get real with him. And in case you're wondering, yeah, I, why would I ever follow Jesus? Or I want to follow him more closely. How can I come, become more 
more intimate with him, it has something to do with this, law and grace. Law and grace give birth to intimacy. I think this woman is reflecting this. The law reveals that sin reveals sin. It's, it's actually when you, when you study the holiness of God and the law of God, the ways of Christ, the values of, of the Lord, sin springs to life because we see the law and we go, oh, and our flesh just wants to go exactly against it. That's what Romans 7, 9 teaches. Romans 5, 20 says that the law increases sin. God's law was given so that people could see how sinful they were, but as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace become, became more abundant. The law shows our need for the gospel. The law terrifies us with the wrath and displeasure of God to drive us to Christ. So in other words, the gospel is God's approval of us on the basis of God clothing us with the righteousness of Christ and our recognition of us badly needing it because of who God is. Martin Luther wrote about this in On the Freedom of the Christian, and he uses an illustration from marriage to get this point across. When a bride marries a, a bridegroom, my son just got married last Saturday, and it's beautiful to think about, but Everything that she has belongs to him, and everything the bridegroom has belongs to her. And in the gospel, what do we bring to the marriage? <laughs> well, we bring a repentance, but we, we say we're giving up entirely on our sin, but we, we bring our sin. What does Christ bring? He brings us his righteousness. His righteousness. All of it becomes ours by faith. So if your worship is inexpensive, may, maybe, or intimate, maybe you should spend a little time thinking about the holiness of God. Because boy, do you need it. So do I. And then worship is expensive. She brought this alabaster jar of perfume. These jars were beautiful. These are not probably what they look like, but they were made of translucent, compact gypsum, carved usually with a long neck that was to be broken when the uh, uh, ointment was poured out. And so in today's terms financially, it's estimated that this perfume she poured out over Jesus' feet would have cost about forty to $50,000 dollars. So what does that show? It shows, this, this woman shows that our very, very best belongs in the dust at Jesus' feet. She's showing faith here. She's saying, even as she pours out the perfume, this is not mine, it belongs to him. I, I have to do something to show that he is everything to me now. And God will provide for me anyway. Yeah, I could have used that money, but I don't care. Jesus is everything. That's what real repentance looks like. Everything belongs to him. And then a couple of more thoughts. Love, it goes on to say, um, it, it forgives and it, and it rescues. In verse 47, uh, this word, afia me, uh, your sins are forgiven, it means to remit or to be sent away. To forgive means to be sent away, and it's like dismissal. It's like when Jesus turns away from the Pharisee and turns back to the woman, he goes, he said, woman, and he's saying it to you, if you put your faith in Jesus, dismissed have been your sins, dismissed. Psalm 103, verse 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he, has he removed our transgression, transgressions from us. It's, they're, go they're gone. It's like God can't find them. They've been paid for utterly. So you and I can be free from all manner 
of disgraceful sin and the skin's penalty. Now, just really briefly, just for you in case there are, there are some that need to hear this. The Bible says in Colossians 3.13 that just as we have been forgiven, we should forgive others also. So is there anybody you should be forgiving that you haven't yet? You've been forgiven and you are to forgive like you've been forgiven. Maybe you need to call them and go out to coffee with them. Or maybe it's best that you don't ever see them again. It's been that kind of a grievance and you just need to forgive them. In that case, I would encourage you to do what I've done on a couple of occasions in my life where I, I, didn't, I couldn't see this person again, but I was definitely not forgiving them. I held out my hands. I put all of my bitterness into anger and sometimes hate into my fists and held it tight until I was ready to say, dismissed have been your sins and I open up my palms and say that person doesn't owe me a thing I release that person to the care and concern of God two more quick thoughts that's a typo there love transforms life not life this this whole thing ends with Jesus saying dismissed have been your sins now go in peace in other words, he's saying, get up, all is well. Let's walk together throughout life. That's what I've been doing for 50 years. She was transformed, and the peace that she now has with God gave her the peace of God in her journey. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, they had no idea that Jesus had the authority to forgive sin, but in another account, Matthew 9 uh, Jesus said to a paralytic, uh, lame person, he said, get up, you're healed. And the Pharisees got all upset about that. And he says, you know, take heart, your, your sins are forgiven. And healing him said to the whole crowd, I have the authority to forgive sin. And he does. But what that gives us is peace with him so that we can have the peace of God with him. Just the other day, I was praying with somebody. Actually, that somebody's in this room. And, 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 and just think about the peace of God going with you. Hey, go in peace. Get up. Just think of the, from this to that. From this uh, to go, go in peace. From being judged and all this around her. He's saying, hey, you, you do not equal this man's opinion or your past performance. And neither do you. You don't equal the, uh, your personage doesn't equal opinions of others and your performance. Not to God. He's saying, no, 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 no. I love you. Walk with me. I created you. Walk with me. Find in me your purpose. Now, this, the other day when I was praying with this person, I reminded of myself. It's like, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. The Lord is near. Let your forbearing, content, and satisfied spirit be made known to all. Whatever is worrying you, pray about it with thanksgiving, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That means the peace that we have with God can be the peace of, of God as we walk through life, and it protects our hearts. So finally, what we see in this passage is loving Jesus puts faith in Jesus. Her faith um, saved her from her sin and consequences. And faith, you know what faith is. It's confident trust. It's reliance. And if you've never expressed it to Jesus, you've never said, Lord, please forgive me my sin. I beg you to do it right now. In your heart of hearts, why wouldn't you? Just turn like this woman did to him and said, Jesus, you died to forgive me of my sin, and I need that, and I'm astounded that I have it with you. Thank you. And you rose from the dead to give me new life. I need that. Give that to me. Give me new life. 
and you take those two gifts that he provided to you by faith. Forgiveness and a new life. You can do that right now. I'll close with this reflection and then somebody will come up here and close. Her worship begs that we ask these questions. What would it look like for you to offer God a gift of extravagant surrender? What vial of perfume is yours to break open and pour at Jesus' feet? You might want to take a picture of that slide. Think about that tomorrow morning when you get up. Simon saw the sin, Jesus saw the sinner. Simon saw her depravity, Jesus saw her love. Is there anybody that you've been looking down on, like Pharisee Simon was, considering that their sin is more serious than yours? Do you need to repent of any self-righteous attitudes toward anybody? I'd encourage you to do that. And then lastly, when you face the reality of your own sins, remember that God is merciful. His forgiveness is real. It's very necessary for us too. Thank you for your word and for loving us so. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, you know, it's, um, this passage reminds us of another passage in Mark 14 where a woman poured very expensive ointment over Jesus' head. And, and later in Mark 14, Jesus is explaining uh, to his disciples the significance of the meal that, they are, that he was sharing with them. And, and when he holds the cup to them, he says, this is, my, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Jesus poured out his blood for us so that we can have forgiveness and life. The things that Dave just shared with us, so we can have peace and joy and we can worship the Lord. It's an extravagant, his love for us is extravagant. And it reminds us a little bit of the extravagant love that the, the woman showed for Jesus. So this morning, uh, as we take uh, communion as we do every week, we're reminded of God's grace towards us. It's, it's extravagant love that, he, that, that was shared for us, that he poured out for us. And so as you receive the, the bread and the, and the juice, just remember this grace, this extravagant love that was showed for us. And, and then remember, too, that in this, it's, it's, it's a symbolic um, reminder that God's grace is always present. It's not just something that happened once in the past, but God's grace is sufficient and uh, available all the time to walk into that as he calls us to trust him. He gives us grace to trust him. Everything we do in the Christian life is because of his grace. And so we, uh, we uh, take joy in that, and that we take joy in this, in this meal together. And so as you um, uh, just as a reminder, um, I, I, and I think it's pretty, pretty much those of us who have, who have been here, um, but we, um, this is a sacrament for all who have placed their faith in Christ. And if you've not yet, if you're not at that point where you have not made a decision to follow Jesus and surrender to him, it's okay to remain in your seat. Uh, and that's, 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 um, be fine. There's no judgment in that. Um, and so, but as we, as we prepare for this, would you stand with me as I, as I read God's word um, uh, that, that Paul gave us? He says, for I received from the Lord uh, that which I passed on to you and delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he uh, was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me, as often as you eat it. In the same way, he took the, the cup after supper and he said, this, is, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. And so we, in this, we are celebrating the gospel and we're reminded that Jesus is coming back. So together let us proclaim the mystery of our faith, that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again, hallelujah.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in, in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. The body and blood of Christ broken and shed for us. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Both his covenant and his blood supports me in the whelming flood. And all around my soul gives way. He then is all my open say. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Church, as we go this week, I receive this benediction, this blessing from 2 Thessalonians. It says, May the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good and deed and word. 
Amen.